This is the Create Your Own Life Show, episode 651 with Dan Carlin. I'm not even sure it's real. I mean, so if we ask about something like toughness, I mean, go look it up in terms of a dictionary term. What the hell does that mean? It's one of those things okay. where if you and I are talking about some guy we know, and you say something like, well, that's a very tough guy, um, that might have a meaning that word in that context between you and between me. But but does that mean anything? I mean, if you have a lot more tough, in air quotes, people in your society, does that impact your society in any way? It's, it's not something, you know, this is part of why human history resists being a hard science. Because what the hell would you, I mean, how would you even define toughness? So to go back to the Spartans that we talked about earlier, the Greeks uniformly considered the Spartans of their day to be the toughest Greeks out there. But how would they compare to any non-Greeks, right? The Greeks are only comparing them to the people they know. This is the Create Your Own Life show, where we interview people that are world-class performers, from Super Bowl champions to New York Times bestsellers to billionaires. We figure out what makes them tick and unpack it for you to do the same. I'm Jeremy Ryan Slate, and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we help you to create your own life. Hey, what is up, everybody? Jeremy here, and welcome to episode 651. This is an episode I have really been looking forward to, as our guest today is the host of the Hardcore History Podcast, Dan Carlin, and we're going to be talking about his book, The End is Near, where he takes a look at apocalyptic events through history, and I really enjoyed it. So this is going to be a little bit of a different episode for you guys. We're not going to cover... As much of the business and personal development stuff that we talk about, but we're going to be having a little bit of a different conversation. As those of you guys may know, and some of you may not, I have my master's in ancient history, so I love studying stuff like this. So we're going to tackle a few different subjects today that Dan, we look at through the, the lens of Dan's book. The first being that as even a nation, a world, or a country, are we tougher or less tough than we were hundreds or even thousands of years ago. We're going to be looking at global pandemics. How do people react in times like that? And have we shown that we've changed or have we shown that we're the same? We're also going to be taking a look at future catastrophic events as well. Meaning, you know, can we ever see another global conflict because there's so many global powers and we're so connected now as well. So this is going to be a very different interview. Um, I'm really hoping you guys enjoy this since this is something that I really enjoyed putting together and I'm really excited to share with you. So if you're not typically into history topics, open your mind up a little bit, take a look at this one, and I'm sure you're going to love it. There's another great podcast I think you should listen to. It's called The Great Man Within, and hosts tackle problems that men never talk about but secretly struggle with, like sex, purpose, and success. After you're done with today's episode, search for and listen to The Great Man Within on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, don't forget to subscribe for free in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else fine podcasts are served. While you're there, leave us a rating and review because I want to hear from you guys about creating a life on your own terms. All right, without further ado, let's get into this conversation with Dan Carlin, the host of the Hardcore History Podcast. <music> Welcome to the Create Your Own Life show, Dan Carlin. Thank you for having me. Dan, I got to tell you, I am super stoked uh, to have you on. I have been a hardcore history listener for many, many episodes at this point. I actually even buy all of your extra episodes and your addendum feed as well. So I'm really stoked to kind of dive into some things with you today. Well, that's fantastic. Listen, I'm just glad uh, that you've been listening for so long. I appreciate that. Totally. I, so I wanted for for those of my listeners that aren't really familiar with the concept of hardcore history. I, I want to just kind of set the stage here before we uh, jump into your book, which is the major thing I wanted to discuss with you today. You know, what is the Hardcore History Podcast? Why did you start it? And um, 
I, I want to get into that a little bit, what your process is like, but let's handle that first. So what is the show? Why did you start it? Well, you know, I, I've actually, you mentioned the Hardcore History Addendum feed, which is the third podcast we've ever done. The first podcast I ever did was something that we adapted from uh, terrestrial radio that I used to do. And so it wasn't a really original concept. And then when we decided to do a podcast about a year, at, maybe a year and a half after starting that one, I thought, well, you know, by then you'd learned a little bit about the artistic parameters of this new medium. And we're talking about 2005. Uh, hardcore history, probably 2006. And so until I'd done it for about a year or so, uh, it, I wasn't really clear on on the, the let's call it the canvas you had to play with. Uh, mm. as, as and a, is this the common sense feed? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Is this, is this your common sense feed or is this uh, the, the common sense feed was the one that started first. And so that Got was it. the one okay. that grew from the radio show. But then somewhere along the line, we thought, well, we you know maybe we'd do another podcast as well. And when we thought about that, we had internalized whatever lessons we had learned from a year of the common sense podcast. And instead of re repurposing some other thing that was originally created for a different format, we had the chance to create something from scratch that that took more advantage of all this open canvas space that the medium allowed. The only problem was, is we really didn't have any idea what it was going to sound. I mean, it, you know, you have to remember back in this era, uh, there were no professional outlets doing podcasts at all. Totally. This was, yeah, I mean, this was mostly kids in dorm rooms and stuff. Um, so, so we weren't really sure what would work and what made sense. And and I always compare um, maybe the first 10, 15 of our podcast to the first 10 or 15 episodes of some long running TV series you like. Uh, I mean, I always say Seinfeld wasn't Seinfeld for the first 10 episodes. If you go watch it, they're, they're figuring it out, right? They had a concept they started with and that based on experience and growth and chemistry and all that, it develops into whatever it, it eventually develops into. So if you go listen to the first hardcore history show we ever did, it's like 20 minutes long. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't really sound In like comparison, the comparison. That's a joke to what you put out now. <laughs> yeah. Well, and listen. From, from our standpoint, it might be a heck of a lot easier to be putting out twenty minute shows. But you only have. It's funny to say this when you really control every aspect. But you have less control over the growth of these things and the evolution of these things than you might think. Um, sometimes you find out based on listener feedback stuff that you had assumed was right is wrong. And stuff that you'd never thought about doing, um, you could think about doing. I mean, the first time we ever had a show that went over an hour long, I inserted an apology to the listeners at the end of it because I thought this was such a profound imposition on their time. And the feedback we got from the listeners, which have been fascinating ever since, was we have pause buttons. And I never thought about that. It never <laughs> occurred to me that, oh, you know, maybe we don't have to worry so much about these deadlines that we thought we did, these artificial constraints. And so – the show becomes something that was never part of the original intention. So when you say, how did you come up with a show where we talk sometimes for six hours straight about history? Uh, it was an evolutionary process, and the listeners played a, a pretty decently sized role in getting us there. Well, I want to talk a little bit about your process, too, because I've, I've heard you talk a little bit about it before, how you, um, I believe on the Tim Ferriss show, how you, you, know, you, you sit down and do some recordings. It takes you some time because, you know, these episodes now, you're talking about them being six hours. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, six months before they come out. And, and I, I want to make a comparison here to, to the, when I listen to one of your episodes, like, I feel like I did some work, man, because they're very, very involved. It's like watching like a, an Oliver Stone movie where I feel like I like had to work this whole time I watched it. So what is your process like in terms of, you know, putting together an episode? Well, I mean, one of the things we try to focus on, because I think it makes a lot of sense when you're getting a, a history podcast from a guy who does not have a PhD in history is what the heck are you getting from me that's unique and valuable? Because otherwise, why wouldn't you just go uh, uh, pick up a book from one of the people that we use for our research? Or why wouldn't you go watch a movie or a, or a historical documentary or something? And so at the outset, we try to figure out what the hell it is I'm giving you that's that's worth your time. And and this aspect is usually, I always describe it like the weaving of a rope where mm -hmm. you have different strands. And we try to weave. So, I mean, for example, we did a series, and, and I think about these more like audiobooks now rather than podcasts because it's a it's probably a more accurate representation of what you're getting. So when you say you felt like you worked, it feels a little like reading a, a history book, but but hopefully one that that grips you because we try to um, include these, these questions. Uh, and I'm a big questioner. I come from a journalistic background. I'm not a big answerer. Um, 
We did one on the Mongols, for example, and we wove through the, the tale one of these really human questions that history raises, doesn't answer, but raises. And it had to do with uh, generations having to pay some sort of terrible price in order to maybe we would say create historical process, progress. So with the Mongols, there are people that write books today that um, maybe we would call them uh, uh, devil's advocate positions or trying to make up for historical injustices. And they'll talk about all the wonderful things that Genghis Khan and the Mongols did. And so one of the things we wove through that series is, okay, we'll accept that premise, but it's undeniable all these terrible things that happened too. Is that the price that a generation has to pay so that a future generation can have something better? In other words, does one generation have to pay the historical bill or the historical tab for another generation's um, good times? And and when you weave that through the story, I feel like that's where we add our own personal little twist or spice or value um, and then when you, you, you get to the end of the story, hopefully it's been a whole lot more than just names and dates and facts and stuff like that. It, it tries to give you a sense of the dramatic situation these people are in in these stories and some of the larger human questions that they raise. Absolutely. Well, I just finished your, your book, which is amazing. It's called The End is Always Near Apocalyptic Moments from the Bronze Age Collapse to Nuclear Near Misses. And in terms of putting together the show versus putting together a book, did you find it difficult? And I do recommend people pick up the, the audio edition because uh, you read it if you get the audible edition. Uh, but in terms of putting together the book versus putting together an episode, like was that difficult for you to adapt from one to the other? Because like you just said, it is more of like an audio book that you're doing every time you produce one of these. Or So what was that, I guess, adaption like for you? Difficult. Um, it's differently. And so you, you, you wish that you weren't, at least I wish that I wasn't such a novice at it because it's been a long time since I've been a novice at anything and I'm out of practice. Um, and I'm also, a, you know, a verbal person. Uh, I speak relatively naturally. And the wordsmithing that is a part of writing, you know, where you agonize over the construct of a sentence or a paragraph, those sorts of things are somewhat foreign to me. I've written a lot of articles, so 750 word pieces, which is a very different animal as, as, as a, than a book, as you might expect. So I guess, um, I guess I found it to be, in my opinion, a, a less, um, direct way for me to communicate um, because I'm used to doing it the way you and I are now, but it has undeniable advantages too. So a learning experience is the best way I would describe it. Absolutely. Well, I, I guess then I want to take a look at some of the concepts in the book. And, and the thing that I, I found really interesting is you're talking about this concept of people raised in different eras and what we would see as child abuse. Now, if you looked at it, like, let's say, you know, several thousand years ago with the Spartans, you know, they, they, took the children they thought were going to survive and kept them. The ones they didn't, they got rid of and, and they spent a lot of their life in the Agogi training and things like that. So I, I want to take a look at that, that concept. How does the era we're raised in, you know, how does it make us, I guess, more hardy or more able to survive? Well, it's, you know, and we, we talked a second ago about some of these concepts that we weave through stories that are interesting the one you just mentioned is one of those endlessly fascinating and it's it's almost like a third rail of of human history because it there are so many awful things attached to it but um i try to i try to relate it to a star trek episode um there there was the one that had the character khan in it and 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 he's a race of genetic supermen created in an era of human history when genetics and trying to create superior human beings through breeding was supposed to be popular so this is all science fiction but there have been a lot of times in human history where this issue of I mean, when you go to like the Spartans, I don't, I don't know how much they thought about it the way like the Nazis thought about it. But there have been a lot of times in human history where increasing the quality of the breed, for lack of a better term, <laughs> has fascinated people. Now, obviously, we see where that can lead, right? When you've got Nazis who are uh, executing disabled people and, and subhuman species as they see them. So we obviously can see how that kind of stuff goes. But when you look at some of the history where where societies seem to be trying to mold a certain kind of human being, I don't know how you can't help but find a certain weird fascination in the plasticity of our genetics. And 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 you know, I mean, I often have this fantasy. There are there are a lot of uh, rulers in history that would have 
you know, I mean, maybe even go back to biblical times, a thousand wives, all of them bearing multiple children. And I thought to myself, how interesting would it be to be an individual who got a chance to see a thousand different ways your genes could scramble together to create a different set of DNA and, and different outcomes? Well, I mean, the Spartan idea of creating sort of a superior species, and like I said, I don't know how much they thought about it that way. They may have just been thinking, you know, if we have weak offspring and infants, we expose them and we don't need them if they're going to be too weak. I mean, maybe that they thought about it in a much more um, utilitarian fashion, no big high-minded, you know, creating a better species. But the end result is fascinating to, you know, to just look at human plasticity and wonder about um, if, if you could, for example, if you could just breed, this is so Naziistic, I don't even believe I'm, but I mean, if you could just breed the very smartest or the very strongest or, or you know, fill in the adjective of human beings for like 10 generations, do you end up with something down the road worthwhile or do you end up with something that's a completely, I mean, like a, a twisted, strange, non-human, abo- I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, is that there are very few actually useful laboratory experiments where you can look at and, and even begin to examine questions like that. But you know, history will provide examples that are a little like using human beings as lab rats and letting you sort of go, hmm, did the Spartans acting this way with their own version of ancient Greek eugenics actually accomplish anything in the end? I mean, if you met a Spartan warrior today and compared them to your average Athenian, would you notice anything that appeared to you beyond training and working out and and a healthy diet? I mean, I, I think it's got this horrible, evil sort of tinge to it, but that doesn't make it less fascinating. Well, I, I guess then taking this too, and also looking at you, you mentioned what Tom Brokaw calls calls the greatest generation, which was the, the World War II generation, and I guess like looking at our generation now, it does seem like you know I guess we've lost some toughness in a way. I, I guess like taking a look at that, then Dan, do you feel like we've lost toughness, and and if so, like what things do you think creates that in a people? Well, I mean, I'm fascinated with this issue specifically because. Um, I'm not even sure it's real. I mean, so if we ask about something like toughness, I mean, go look it up in terms of a dictionary term. What the hell does that mean? It's one of those (laughs) things where if you and I are talking about some guy we know and you say something like, well, that's a very tough guy, um, that might have a meaning, that word, in that context between you and between me. But, But does that mean anything? I mean, if you have a lot more tough, in air quotes, people in your society does that impact your society in any way? It's, it's not something, you know, this is part of why human history resists being a hard science. Because what the hell would you, I mean, how would you even define toughness? So to go back to the Spartans that we talked about earlier, the Greeks uniformly considered the Spartans of their day to be the toughest Greeks out there. But how would they compare to any non-Greeks, right? The Greeks are only comparing them to the people they know. So, so are they as tough as an Aztec warrior? Are they, you know, I mean, so you... So it becomes one of those relative terms that that doesn't mean anything overall. But if you think it means something when we're talking about that guy we know, well, then there's an intrinsic, non-definable value. And it's natural, I think, and historians ever since the Greek times have been doing this, it's natural to look at different societies and wonder about it on a collective level. So you mentioned Brokaw's, let's call it a marketing term when he called the Second World War generation the greatest generation. I always call it a marketing term because I'm pretty damn sure like every group of parents that's ever existed, the World War II generation's parents probably thought they were a bunch of softies, you know? (laughs) So, so, I mean, I think that's one of those things that always continues throughout human history, right? Um, But that having been said, it's pretty easy to look at my grandfather and see that in by many metrics that we might look at today, you know, how do you judge toughness? Well, how about the ability to withstand privation or whatever? I, I would say he was a much tougher person than I am. The question that's interesting, though, that takes this out of the realm of just being a silly sort of question is, does it matter? And and is something like toughness something that you need more in certain conditions? The Spartan needs it in his world, but we don't need it as much now. In other words, there might be a an offsetting quality Toughness may come at the expense of some other human condition that's important, right, um, that, that it offsets. And if you get more toughness, maybe you get less of this other human quality. Could we suggest that we're benefiting now from having more of that? I mean, if you said that toughness has an inverse relationship to something like art, 
which it doesn't. But let's just I mean, I'm trying to put in a value for X there. Sure. That, I mean, this when, when historians um, in earlier times used to think of life cycles of nations that start out with really tough people. And then those tough people, because they're tough, go and conquer, you know, great things and become, you know, uh, uh, the height of their power where they can devote some leisure time to arts and entertainment and the softer cultured pursuits. And then they supposedly, by that old standard, slip into sloth and gluttony and all those sorts of things and lose all their toughness. And that's that old life cycle of nations people used to believe in a long time ago. Well, that would imply that there were some values that that once the toughness goes down a little, you can begin to indulge in. So to answer your question, it might be interesting to wonder if we don't need the kind of toughness the Second World War generation had because we live in different times and to offset you know, what they brought to the table, we have other skills. And to, to give you an example of what I mean, I mean, we've got war fighters who operate with video game tools from the center of the United States now and kill terrorists on the other side of the globe. And How many push-ups do you have to be able to do in order to do that job well? Do you see what I'm saying? So, yeah, so zero. It, they never have to face anybody. But but so perhaps you need a certain level of toughness for a certain reality and you don't for another reality. So it's not necessarily saying that we've lost something to say that we're less tough than previous generations. It's more an examination of the adjective itself and what it would mean as applied to human beings and how you would measure or study it or anything like that. Does it matter or doesn't it matter? Well, I think it's almost it's morphed a little bit if we look at the American experience specifically. And and I guess to, to put this in, into perspective, like what I mean is I feel like I guess football specifically and you know maybe hockey to some extent, but football specifically, I feel like it started to fill that what would have been that campaigning season or that toughness thing that um, a lot of, you know, men of that age would have fulfilled, let's say, you know, hundreds or thousands of years ago. Do you, do you think that's correct in that in that thought process, Dan? Well, I mean, I think sports have always provided a, a, a sort of a pseudo combat environment for you. I mean, if you look at the Native American lacrosse type games that they used to play, I mean, if you if you go to societies all around the world, I mean, they have competitive sports that involve athletic prowess. And so I think there's a connection there. And I think the more violent uh, and more warlike the sport, the more obvious the connection. But I do think that you could suggest pretty easily, although we'd have to talk to an anthropologist or something like that, that that they fulfill some of the same needs. Um, and if you look at it from a societal point of view, I would suggest that maybe um, blows off some of the same steam that in early warrior societies, the occasional raid or whatever blew off. Um, I just know that when I played football, I got a charge out of it. And, you know, I would just play with friends, but it was full tackle football. And I got such a afterwards, just such a charge out of it. And I, I can't explain why or how, but I could certainly see how it would have fulfilled a similar need for people in other times and other places. This episode is sponsored by Audible. Audible is offering all Create Your Own Life listeners a free month of Audible and or a free audiobook download. And right now, you guys can actually get today's guest, Dan Carlin's book, The End is Near, for free or any other book for free over at jeremyryanslate.com slash book. That's jeremyryanslate.com slash book to get your free audiobook courtesy of Audible. <music> Absolutely. Well, well, one of the other concepts that you talked about in your book and is, is the idea of the Great Plague. And you spent some time on the Plague of Athens and you know how Pericles lost his sons during that standpoint and, and, and things like that. But I think like historically looking back, I, I think we look at it a little jaded and we say something like that can't happen again. But I think history time and time again, you know, proves to us that can happen again. And also how people respond during that time as, you know, I, I guess to compare that, let's say to Hurricane Katrina, where, you know, there was shoplifting and stealing and things like that. And that all happened during these plague times. So I guess looking back, why do you think we think things like this can't happen again, like historically looking back? Because we've had a pretty darn wonderful last hundred years in that mm. regard. Um, I mean, it's funny, but if you look at all of human history up till now, people a hundred years ago would better be able to understand the rhythms of human life of a person in ancient Egypt than they would be able to understand ours. And, and if you wanted to look at the many different things that separate us from the eras a uh, hundred years or more beyond us, I, I can't see how disease isn't number one on the list. 
Uh, I, I always try to make these comparisons because numbers mean something. Um, and, and I think we use this one in the book, but everybody understands how upsetting and destabilizing and, and terrible uh, uh, the AIDS epidemic has been in, in the planet since the late 1970s, really, early 1980s. Um, but if you actually wanted to put a number on it, uh, the current death toll, I think, is about 34 or 35 million people worldwide since the late 70s. Um, now, that's devastating. But smallpox, which was only one disease out of a whole plethora of things people were exposed to all the time, used to kill 55 million people annually wow. as recently as 75 years ago. Um, and it kills you in a week. And there's a huge, you know, I, I, I think people uh, who were heavily affected in communities that were heavily affected by AIDS would point out that that as devastating as it was, the fact that people uh, were able to live with the disease for a long time changed the impact of it. Imagine that we had lost everybody that we've lost from AIDS, 34, 35 million people in a week. Um, that it, it's hard to get your mind around. And then when you realize that smallpox is but one of, like I said, all these different things that can get you, and you begin to realize how people like Edward Gibbon, who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, how a guy like that could grow to adulthood and have lost every one of his siblings by that time. And I think he had six of them. Uh, now, that's an unusual killing rate, even for back then. But when you realize how, I mean, I, and this was the example we did use in the book, but today, if you find out a couple has lost a child, that is one of the most devastating things we as parents can think about. And you have just, you, you always wonder how they get through their day. How do you live with that? It's just, it's, it's this albatross on the shoulder of people. It's horrible. But then you realize, what if everybody you know had lost a child? And what if a lot of people had lost multiple children? You can't quantify what that does to a society, but you don't have to be a genius to know it does something. Mm. And so that's when we, when we wanted to talk about the impact of disease on human beings, all you have to do is talk about losing loved ones and losing lots of loved ones and then lots of people around you losing lots of loved ones. I mean, does that make you less likely, for example, to bond with your young children? And if it did, wouldn't you understand why? So, I mean, these are the kind of intellectual dominoes that start tumbling when you start asking questions like, gee, what would it be like if even one of those terrible diseases revisited us today? I mean, look at the panic we can have over an Ebola type virus or a Marburg type virus, some of these hemorrhagic fevers, uh, like they might get out of control or an avian flu. But we don't know what that means. Nobody in living memory knows what that means. Right. Like here in the, in the New York area, there was like a, a measles outbreak last year and it wasn't even that large, but the news was, was freaking out over it. So I think, you know, maybe we aren't able to handle right now as large scale things. And it's, I think, a gradient to getting there to being able to handle something on that scale as well. Well, when we talked about using history as laboratory experiments, right, well, there's too many variables to draw real conclusions from. But 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 it's interesting to look. Um, the, we had a terrible flu known as the Spanish influenza strike at the end of the First World War, 1918, 1919, 1920. And it shut down whole American cities because people weren't willing to go out and do their jobs and risk infection. But when you realize what happens when the cops don't show up to work, right, and, and the, the basic people who keep your society running stay home, it, it was a bit of a wake-up call, if you go back and read that, to see exactly how quickly, not disease, but simply the fear of disease can take our societies and throw a monkey wrench into the whole machine that, that sort of regulates and runs our whole lives. So – one of the things that I found also really interesting is you talked about the movie Planet of the Apes and you're talking about when, you know, they zoom out and you see, see the Statue of Liberty on the ground. And it's, it's, you know, very shocking to you that it's happened. And looking at total civilization collapse, is that as possible now as it was, let's say, you know, 200 years ago, because we are so technologically connected, but, you know, a great example of that is our, our BMW the other day, the, the battery and the alternator went, which means we can't do anything with the car, including get it on a tow truck. So like w in this day and age, like, can we see the type of collapses we see in the past, um, you know, word technology or something to fail? Uh, you know, I, I'm going to answer this in a very long winded way because I love the way <laughs> he put it. There's an economic writer named Robert Samuelson who was talking about the Great Depression 
and talking about how much uh, sort of fun that modern economists make at the people of that day for being so stupid that they they blundered into something that we would never blunder into with our knowledge today. And he basically was trying to say, no, we would not blunder into a Great Depression for the same reasons. We would blunder into a Great Depression for totally new reasons, right? In in things we can't foresee. So don't get don't get so arrogant about it was his point. Our society has more built in redundancy than a lot of earlier societies that failed. And so on one hand, you would say there's backup systems, there's safeties, there's this, there's that, there's there's. There's other countries. So, I mean, there's a when you think about how dark ages, you know, in air quotes, right, used to happen. Part of the way that they were made possible was that it was in times before the planet was completely connected. And so if a place like China, for example, had a down period, that whole part of the world had a down period. But if China had a down period today, the other powers on the planet would sort of make up for. So if you think about nations and cultures and civilizations like giant power outlets, Back in the day when you relied on a single power outlet, if Rome fell, all those places that depended on Rome also had a downtime. But if you have multiple power stations, you know, Rome goes, but you still have China. Well, maybe you've 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 reduced your chance of of a complete blackout. So on one hand, we have more redundancy. So you say, well, we don't have the same chances of falling. Robert Samuelson will say, uh, don't get too cocky, because what we also have is more complexity. Right on the on the one hand, the redundancy should save you, but on the other hand, the complexity itself breeds problems that we don't you can't foresee till they happen. So um, there's a wonderful book uh, edited by uh, Nick Bostrom, who's at Oxford, called Global uh, Catastrophic Risks. There's a lot of math in it, but the bottom line is he talks about all these different things that could go sideways on us, but you won't know till it happens. And one of the most famous chapters in the book is on uh, artificial intelligence. He actually took that whole chapter out and expanded it into an entire book. But the idea of artificial intelligence is a perfect example of something that could create theoretically that catastrophic dark age type risk but it's not a sort of a risk the people in the Middle Ages or the ancient world ever had to deal with, right? It's a new risk. So so along with the many safeguards that make us less likely to have a dark age are many new threats that that increase the chances. I mean, just look at – let's look at one thing, just one. Uh, anyone who wants to do any research on the biggest nuclear explosion uh, that's ever been detonated, go look up Tsar Bomba is what we call it in the West – uh, I forgot what it is. I'm thinking 50 megatons sounds about wow. right. Thermonuclear weapon. The largest U.S. test was the 15 megaton Castle Bravo test, and that was enormous. The 50 megaton test is a reminder of how nuclear war in the future is not going to be anything like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I mean, this is a bomb thousands of times more powerful than those bombs. And that when you look at, I mean, there are there are wonderful things online that will show you what would happen to Paris if that bomb went off, right? Compared to the Hiroshima bomb, when you realize that you could have lots of those bombs go off in a, in a third world war, you begin to say, hmm, okay, so all this redundancy that makes it harder for us to have a dark age is maybe offset by the fact that we have such greater efficiency in terms of dark age creating tools. And so I'm not sure that um, that we can say that modern society is any less or more likely to have some sort of future age where the Statue of Liberty emerges partially buried in the sand. But I think the whole point of the version on the planet of the apes had to do with nuclear war. Um, so maybe you would say it's a wash. <laughs> Well, it's it's almost mutually assured it, it mutually assured destruction to some point in time. Like I'm going to blow you up, but I'm going to blow you up bigger. And so so there may not be anything left. <laughs> well, and this is you know here's the other funny part about it is once again you know when you start talking about nuclear war, and I don't mean a war like the Second World War where a couple of atomic weapons are used, but a real full on nuclear war, it's all theoretical. We have no case studies to even look and examine, right? I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of the information. And I had to do a lot of research for this for one of the podcasts we did on it. But a lot of the information we have is is stuff that the experts mathematically extrapolated from the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, the only ones where you have any real world tests. But they are so different than than what would be involved in the modern weapons. And nobody has any idea if you have lots of these modern weapons go off what that means. I mean, you've heard the scenario of nuclear winter, but that's only one of them. Nobody knows. And as and some of the friends that I have who are always pointing out how we exaggerate threats would say, 
You could have a third world war and have it not be as bad as some of the experts predict. But how would you know? You know, so um, I mean, I think in terms of 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 something like that, the lack of, of real world case studies to look at makes everything sort of seem like fantasy until it. I mean, that's what we talked about in the book, too. This there's, there's a weird sort of fantastic element to these kinds of topics that sound more like movie titles or science fiction tropes like Planet of the Apes. Then they sound like real swords of Damocles hanging over our head. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, if the, the way that the world felt the day after the Cuban Missile Crisis ended, you could make an argument is the way we should feel every day of our lives because of the threat level. But human beings can't operate that way. And once you get about a generation after those sorts of times, you have people being raised with no memory of that at all. It's almost unrealistic to expect them to have the same level of fear and concern or to be able to sustain it as a society. At the same time, if we ever have a nuclear exchange, people are going to look back and say, why weren't we more on this subject back in peacetime, you know? Well, and I, th I think, too, is that the long lasting ramifications of what something like that could cause, not even the destruction. I, I just spoke in Kiev, Ukraine a couple months ago. And one of, one of the top sites to go see in, in, uh, for tourists there is to grab a Geiger counter and go to Chernobyl and, and kind of walk around and see what you can pick up. And, you know, we're how many years down the road from that? And they're still picking up radiation from something. Like I was going to say you're a brave man. I wouldn't. I, I didn't that. do it, man. I, I have a one year old. <laughs> I would not have done that. Why don't you just smoke four packs of cigarettes a day for a couple of years? I think the risk level is pretty close. <laughs> well, I, I want to bring this back around to the, the core concept of, of what you talked about, about here in the book, Dan. And it's you focused really on the end always being close and these like apocalypses that could always happen. Like, why did you want to focus on that core concept of that, that type of society shift? Well, apparently it's what I'm interested in. One of the, you know, I had mentioned earlier about how I'm a neophyte. I've shown by many of your episodes. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, this is how it happened. I mean, uh, one of the things I'm a neophyte at book writing. So the editors were helping me uh, try to figure all this out. And they suggested that I must have a lot of material in the files, which I do. And they said, why don't you lay it all out sort of on the floor uh, and see if you can find any sort of connecting strands of topical DNA between a bunch of the topics. And to be honest, I'm not somebody that likes to go back and look at my previous work. So I'd never done that. Um, and it was a little bit like doing maybe the ink blot test, at your psychiatrist's office or something, because, you know, you're looking at these shows and you're going, wow, you know, they they do have a lot to do with like apocalyptic this and end of the world that or what. I mean, enough of them did so that you could easily see it as a book. And so it kind of it kind of was an extrapolation of a lot of ideas. And, and we call them spines, but you could think about them as one of the minor themes or one of the strands in the rope that we talked about earlier. Um, a lot of those spines had to do with the sort of subject in the book. And, and the first two chapters in the book, the one on child rearing and the one on toughness, seem to be a little bit outliers compared to the other topics, which are so directly related to things that cause problems like disease or nuclear war or the fall of, of your government. Um, but those first two chapters are supposed to represent elements of the plasticity of the human species, right? We keep being told that our number one survival trait is our ability to adapt, right? So you think of like a coyote. And if you poison coyotes, they have more pups to make up for the fact that you poison them. And so we wanted to discuss first, and maybe it should have been at the end, I'm not sure I, the organization turned out the way I, I, I intended, but but we wanted to discuss the ability of human beings to roll with these historical punches should they happen again. And the combination of how we are born and how we are raised seem to be the two elements that involve, you know, you had mentioned the Spartans, sort of their um, the way that they do eugenics, maybe. Um, whether human toughness and the way we raise our kids could compensate for living in a post-nuclear world, for example, I felt was was sort of the crux of the story, right? Because we're not just talking about these bad things happening, but we're talking about our ability to, to survive them, deal with them, react to them, and then try to create some kind of meaningful existence in the wake of them. Um, one of the things we talked about, I, I think, in the book, and I've always wondered about is, I mean, think about the difference in try as a parent. In trying to create children who can function well in their world, if you're raising them in Beverly Hills today versus if you're raising them in Stalingrad in 1944, um, it's a different, you know, sometimes you need to be raising Apaches, 
And sometimes you need to be uh, raising computer geeks. I mean, different times call for different levels of adaptation. And so we thought that those first two chapters were a way of, of giving you sort of the practical human side of, you know, we talked about Edward Gibbon losing his six siblings. I think it was six. And how if a lot of parents at that same time period also lost siblings, how does society react? And so we wanted to talk about how you roll with those historical punches. And so that's kind of the way the book is outlined. Well, I guess just as we're, we're coming down here for a landing, Dan, I, we, we got one listener question for you. Um, and Michael Woodward wanted to know, was there a topic or currently is a topic you're intimidated to cover on a future Hardcore History episode? Oh, my goodness. Lots of them. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's funny because the, the real compliment on the part of the listeners is that they often think I can talk about any historical subject. And I get requests for things all the time. Can you talk about 17th century India, please? And it's flattering as heck that someone would think I knew enough to do that, but I don't. I mean, the, all the topics that we talk about are things that I already have a foundational knowledge base to begin with. And then I begin my research from there. Um, to try to educate yourself from ground zero on something is simply not possible, you know, in the time frame that we have between shows. Um, and, and so when he says, is there something you're intimidated by? Holy cow. I mean, most of the things would be most of the things is a good, <laughs> is a good answer. I mean, the few things that I'm not intimidated by are the things you get episodes on. How about that? <laughs> well, I, I guess looking at like future content plans, like, you know, is there something that you're putting out in terms of an episode thought process that you're really excited about? I know for myself, I'm, I'm hoping at someday in the future to see something either about uh, Alexander the Greater or Cesare Borgia that I find to be two of the most intriguing historical characters. But is there any big episode ideas you have coming down the pike? I keep certain ones in my back pocket, certain ones that I, you know, you say to yourself, OK, I know somewhere down the road, this will be a great show. Right. Because I, I know I know what I know about it. Right. So the first World War topic was when we had it in our back pocket for a long time. And then we decided to do it for the centennial uh, of the conflict. And that was and that was, I think, a pretty good series. Um, I'm pretty harsh on myself, but, you know, I give it a C. Um, pretty good by our standards. Uh, the. Uh, the idea of future shows that we have in our back pocket, a good example is Alexander. You mentioned Alexander. I tiptoe around Alexander a lot. So I've done shows the King about- King of Kings series, you mentioned him. Uh, yeah, and we did a whole, um, early on, a, a show called the, the Macedonian Soap Opera, which is about the uh, sort of the succession afterwards. So there's a lot of Alexander tiptoed around there. I may do one in the future uh, about another- So we're trying to sort of stay- clear of directly talking about Alexander, even though the first hardcore history show we ever did was called Alexander versus Hitler, and we still tiptoed around Alexander. So there, there will be at some point a massive, I think, um, look at him. Uh, the Borgia thing probably won't happen for the, men the things I mentioned earlier in terms of, of, of really knowing the subject well enough, but I've been studying Alexander my whole life, and I still feel like, you know, uh, there's so much more to know. I'm, I'm still waiting for them. There was a story the other day. Uh, they may be getting, I mean, I've been saying this for 35 years, so bear with me, but they may be getting close to finding the guy's tomb. I mean, I would, that would wow. just be, I'm not sure there would be, somebody compared it to finding Tutankhamun's tomb in terms of importance. And I thought, it's not even close. Tutankhamun was not an important Egyptian ruler, but Alexander, the, so, so to answer your question, I'm, I'm so taken with the guy as a historical figure, whether he was a butcher or a philosopher king, or something between the two, um, that I got that in my back pocket, and hopefully we can turn that into at least a C-plus show whenever I do it. Well, I'm, I'm very excited for that, because I think he's the great example of absolute power corrupting absolutely, because he tried to be the philosopher king, but then he kind of went the other way and went a little crazy when he killed his friend Clytus the Black, and a lot of that stuff that happened along that way. Or did um, any of that even <laughs> ever happen? I mean, that's the when you start thinking about ancient history and listen, Alexander was one of the first really great propagandists the world has ever known. What the hell do we really know about this? So, I mean, that's that's right there. You know, when you talk about him, one of the fun things is going to be how do we think we know what we know about the guy? Well, and, and that's the the interesting concept about him is is he was one of the first ones to take his, his publicist with him on campaign. And that's what the, the writer Arian was. He's was like, Alexander was like, all right, write this stuff. And that's most of the remaining stuff we have other than what Plutarch wrote hundreds of years down the road. So what do we really remember? The guy's basically like murdering everybody by the end <laughs> of his, his young life. So if you're Arian writing what he wants you to write, how likely is it to show the blemishes and the warts? And, and then when he shows the blemishes and the warts, you have to say to yourself, 
okay, why did Alexander allow him to show the blemishes? I mean, it becomes one of these things where you're trying to dissect the propaganda of somebody who lived more than 2000 years ago, who was hated by a lot of his contemporaries and then lionized by a bunch of people centuries later. I mean, the whole thing is just I'm going to have a good time with that show only because I've been thinking about Alexander on my own spare time for about 50 years now. Well, I have about 11 books on the bookshelf next to me as we're speaking. Dan, this has been so much fun. I was really excited for this episode, and I really appreciate you spending time today. For the people out there listening, if they want to check you out, check out Hardcore History or your book, The End is Always Near, where's the best place to go? Well, listen, you can always go to the website, dancarlin.com, and somehow, some way, it ought to be able to get you to where you want to go. So uh, uh, listen, I hope it was a good show. I appreciate you having me on, and I hope your audience gets something out of it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today, Dan. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Hey, guys. Thanks for hanging out with me and Dan today. You can check him out over at dancarlin.com, where you guys can get the show notes for this episode over at jeremyryanslate.com slash 651. Also, don't forget to subscribe for free in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else fine podcasts are served. And while you're over there, leave us a rating review because I want to hear from you guys. All right. Thank you so much for hanging out today. Have an amazing day and get out there and create your own life. <laughs>